Well, good morning, everybody. And happy Easter once again to everybody. Glad that uh, you could be with us this morning as we finish our series. Our series has been Easter through the eyes, and we began with Easter through the eyes of the Pharisees and the Sadducees, and then we did Easter through the eyes of Pilate and Herod. Last week we did Easter through the eyes of Peter and uh, Judas, and this week we're doing Easter through the eyes of those who saw. And what that means is this morning we are gathered together on a completely different continent, speaking a completely different language, than the first century Second Temple Jews that proclaimed a crucified Messiah rose again. And that unto itself is an amazing fact. Because how many other crucified Messiahs are being celebrated this morning? Um, we exist, the church exists, the church is here because of Easter, and if you look in your bulletins, you see that I'm doing the E-A-S-T-E-R. Some of you have been through my E-A-S-T-E-R presentation before, but if you look at your notes, you'll notice I've switched things up a bit and changed the, changed the order and changed how we're going to do this this morning. Uh, one of the great questions that ever arose in church history is, can we know what the earliest Christians believed. Can we possibly know what the earliest Christians believed? And one of the things that we sometimes fail to remember, we sometimes fail to uh, recognize, is the Bible is not a book. The Bible is a collection of books. In fact, biblios from the Greek, collection. If you ever wrote a paper, you had to do a bibliography a collection of the works you cited in your page, right? So the Bible is a collection, and the New Testament is a collection of 27 documents written by early Christians. Can we go even earlier than that? I think we can. Now, Paul is a very interesting case, and if you look on your notes, you're going to see that uh, point number three, we're going to get to Saul's conversion. But uh, there's very early church tradition, it's, it's there by the end of the first century, that both Peter and Paul are martyred under Nero. Now, Nero Caesar dies in 68, therefore, Paul and Peter have to die before 68, stands to reason. Meaning that Paul's documents have to predate 68 uh, of the first century. Meaning that they're very early documents, aren't they? Now, if you look, one thing I'm going to be referring to is uh, the book of Galatians. If you're familiar with the book of Galatians, the book of Galatians deals with the whole question, does a Gentile have to become a Jew in order to become a Christian, or can a Gentile just become a Jew? You read through the book of Galatians, and if you're familiar with the book of Acts, you know that the church had to take up this issue. The church had to deal with this topic. And the church decided, no, according to the New Testament, anybody can just become a Christian. That happened, that church council happened somewhere around 50. 50. But if you read the book of Galatians, Paul doesn't seem to be aware of that happening, telling me that the book of Galatians would be even earlier than 50. Now, can we go even earlier... I think we can. Uh, in the book of 1 Corinthians, Paul had to already convert, and he already had to go on a missionary journey. So in the old world, you didn't have cars, you didn't have buses, you didn't have airplanes. They had the Roman road system, which was a blessing. But Paul had to get from Jerusalem, all the way to Corinth. He had to plant a church there. He had to go away. Enough trouble had to start in that church for him to have had to write a letter. So we are very early, but in this, in this letter to the Corinthians, we find something very interesting. This is 1 Corinthians chapter 15. We're going to begin in verse 3. 
1 Corinthians chapter 15, verse 3. For I delivered to you of first importance what I also received. Meaning that Paul had received this. <clears throat> that Christ died for our sins according to the scriptures. That he was buried and that he was raised on the third day according to the scriptures. And that he appeared to Cephas, that's another name for Peter, then to the twelve. After that he appeared to, another, he appeared to more than 500 of the brethren at one time most of whom remain until now, though some have fallen asleep. Then he appeared to James and then to all the apostles. What's interesting about this is you can read Paul and you can pick up Paul's vocabulary. You can pick up Paul's writing style. And uh, halfway through verse 3, this is not Paul's writing style. Paul is quoting something, and that makes sense, because he says, I received this, and I passed it along to you. You'll notice there's also repetition, according to the scriptures, according to the scriptures. He appeared, then he appeared. And you don't get this in the English, but in the Greek, there's actually meter going on in the text. Pointing to this being a very early creed of the Christian church. A creed was something that was very easily memorized. It was something that was very easily passed along. And it was something that you didn't have to write down because there were quite a few people who couldn't read Greek. When did Paul receive this? Well, let's look at Paul's own testimony. Galatians chapter 1, which I already pointed out is a very early book. Galatians chapter 1, verse 15 but when God, who set me apart even from my mother's womb, had called me through his grace, was pleased to reveal his son in me, that I might preach him amongst the Gentiles, I did not immediately consult with flesh and blood, nor did I go up to Jerusalem to those who were apostles before me. But I went away into Arabia and returned once more to Damascus. Then, three years later, I went up to Jerusalem and became acquainted with Cephas, that's Peter, and stayed with him for 15 days. But I did not see any of the other apostles except James, the Lord's brother. Now, again, we have to ask the question, how early could this meeting between Paul and the others be? I touched on this briefly did the crucifixion happen in 30 or did it happen in 33? Let's just say 30 this morning just for the sake of argument, okay? So the crucifixion happened in 30 and Paul's dead by 68. And Paul has to go on three missionary journeys. His conversion had to have happened pretty quickly, especially considering his own testimony, which we'll get to, that he persecuted the church. He was against the church. And we'll get to why a first century Pharisee would have been against the church. But even critical scholars, this is important, even critical scholars like Bart Ehrman agree that this early meeting was probably where he received this creed. And this, early, uh, and this meeting could have happened within three to five years of the cross. Within three to five years of the cross, the Christian church could have already been preaching and he was raised and he was seen and he was raised and he was seen. That is incredibly, credibly early that the Christian church was already preaching this by that point. And that brings me to my next point and that would be Anastasis. Anastasis is the Greek anywhere in your New Testament where it's translated resurrection, raised again, anything of that nature. It's Anastasis or one of its cognates. I'm not teaching Greek this morning, and Greek has many prefixes and suffixes, and they'll just confuse you. So we'll just go with Anastasis this morning, okay? Now, you can search through classical Greek literature. You can start with Homer, and you can go all the way to the Roman period. And you will never, ever find them using this word anastasis to describe their belief that when you die, you either go to some sort of paradise fields, or you go down to a place of the dead. They never use this word to describe that view. The only time 
you will ever find Greek writers using this word is to say it doesn't happen. And that's pretty powerful testimony that the Greeks and later the Romans viewed it as it doesn't happen. And you've got to understand a little bit of Greek thought, especially influenced by Plato. The body, it breaks down. It gets sick. It gets injured. It gets worn out. Nobody says amen to that? <laughs> In the Greek view, getting out, you go on to some sort of immortality, but you get out. You wouldn't want to come back. Because if you came back you'd have to deal with this body that breaks down. So that was the Greek thought. Now, can we tell what the uh, Second Temple Jews thought of this? Because sometimes the Second Temple Jews did use this word in a metaphorical sense. You'll remember last week I quoted from Ezekiel, the Valley of the Dry Bones. And the Valley of the Dry Bones, the bones coming together and standing back up, and the nation being resurrected. In that case, it's metaphor, right? But can we tell how Paul uses it? We can all agree that uh, in order to understand somebody, you've got to understand what they're saying, right? I'll give you an example. Uh, <clears throat> if, uh, if you were to hear somebody say, I'm mad about my flat. I'm mad about my flat. What does that mean? A flat tire. Yeah, here in America, if somebody was to say that, it's not the way we would say it, but if you heard somebody say, I'm mad about my flat, they have a flat tire. But if we were in the UK, and you heard somebody say, I was mad about my flat, what they're saying is they're overjoyed about their living arrangements. That's very interesting. We can say the exact same words, and yet it means something completely different. So, can we see what Paul, can we see what Paul means when he says this? I think that we can. Going again to 1 Corinthians chapter 15, and you've got to remember that the Corinthians were Gentiles, so they were probably largely influenced by Greek and Roman philosophy. And look at what Paul says to them. 1 Corinthians chapter 15, beginning in verse 12. Now if we preach that Christ has been Anastasis, raised from the dead, how do some, some amongst you say there is no Anastasis? There is no resurrection of the dead. But if there is no resurrection of the dead, even Christ hasn't been raised. He goes on to put it all on the line and say that if Christ has not been raised, then the Christian faith is false. And that's coming from the Apostle Paul. But in its context, Paul is clearly saying the body got back up. The body of Jesus got back up. Anastasis, it's not perfect what we would call it in English, but it comes from two words. Anna, meaning up or again, I'm sorry, up or again, and uh, histeme, not histamine, histeme, stand or stand again. So the Greek word here literally means to stand up again or to get back up. And that's very powerful use of language by Paul, is it not? Okay, I'm sorry, too hot. I even turned the heat down after so many people were in here. <laughs> uh, <clears throat> Let's look again at Paul. Paul is an interesting case. When you think about it, other people throughout history have switched sides, right? Uh, Judas. Um, Benedict Arnold, right? We've seen people switch sides before. Oftentimes, what do you need in order to switch sides? Maybe compensation, power, prestige, wealth, fame, fortune, those kinds of things. Maybe those things could get you to switch sides. Did Paul get any of those things by switching sides, by becoming a Christian? No, there's no early tradition that Paul made a lot of money and retired early and, and so forth. Well, 
if we're, if we're generous with the term retired early, perhaps you could say he retired early. He's probably going to smack me for that when I get to heaven, huh? <laughs> and I'm going to deserve it. That being said, let's look at what Paul says about his life in Judaism. This again is from Galatians chapter 1, verses 13 and 14. Um, For you heard of my former manner, excuse me, for you have heard of my former manner of life in Judaism, how I used to persecute the church beyond measure and tried to destroy it. And I was advanced in Judaism beyond many of my contemporaries amongst my countrymen, being more extremely zealous for the ancient trend ancient traditions of my ancestors. Paul also talks about his life in Judaism in Philippians chapter 3. Philippians chapter 3, beginning in verse 5, he's, he's describing himself circumcised on the eighth day of the nation of Israel, of the tribe of Benjamin, a Hebrew of Hebrews, as to the law, a Pharisee, as to zeal, a persecutor of the church, as to righteousness, which is from the law, blameless. Paul puts out there that my life in Judaism was pretty good. We know that he's from Tarsus. Tarsus is a major city in the ancient world. We can tell by his Greek that he was very well educated. And in the book of Acts, it says that he was trained under the rabbi Gamaliel, which means his family had money in order to send him to the right schools. Moreover, he's able to travel, and he's able to travel freely because somehow his dad was able to get Roman citizenship. So here you've got a guy who has been trained in Judaism, can write terrific Greek, has wealth behind him. He's going to live a good life on that path, and yet he totally switches sides on this issue. Now, He describes himself as a Pharisee, and what probably gets his 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 uh, bonnet being his being his uh, you know what I'm trying to say. (laughs) He's hearing in the synagogues a couple people, a couple people are spreading this message, a couple people are talking about this Messiah who was crucified. The Messiah is not supposed to get crucified. This Messiah who got crucified also died. The Messiah is not supposed to die. And these guys are also saying that then three days later, he came back from the dead. Now, in the Jewish system, resurrection was there, but it's something that happens at the end of time. It's something that God will, ha- God will do at the end of time. It's not something that happens in history, and it's not something that happens to a Messiah. So Paul is saying, these guys are coming into my church, by extension, right? And they are teaching this false stuff. And it gets Paul ready to persecute. And yet he switches sides. Isn't that interesting? He never makes great money. He doesn't have a great life. And yet he switches sides on this issue. Why? Well, again, let's look at Paul's own writing. We're going back to 1 Corinthians chapter 15. Interestingly, Paul, this, this, this language here is Paul once again. Paul adds himself to that creed from earlier. Uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verse 8. And last of all, as to one untimely born, he appeared to me also. Now that is powerful testimony. The guy that I'm against that these corruptors of Judaism are preaching came back from the dead and I'm going to stomp them out and I'm going to stop this, he appeared to me. I saw him. And that was enough to get me to switch sides. And I never made a dime from it and I never got powerful from it. That is powerful testimony right there, is it not? The fact that Saul converted, despite the fact that he was primed to live a great life, he still switched sides on this issue. Now, along those same lines, this is one, so I told you the last time I did E-A-S-T-E-R, I totally took this from one of my professors. 
And I told him I was going to do it. And I, I morphed it. I played with it. I got in touch with him before this Sunday. And I told him I was going to do this again. But I told him I was going to mutate his. Because his here, the T in Easter, was uh, transformed apostles. Which is a good, good thing. But here, I want to focus on traditions changed. And this is really, really hard to give you a good example in America. If we were to rewind the clock back to the early 20th century, the mass majority of the population went to some sort of religious service during the week. The, the, that number would just be staggering. Whereas here, at the beginning of the 21st century, the population of the church has truly decreased, has it not? And the population of those who don't attend any kind of weekly service on any kind of regular basis has increased, right? But that took generations. That didn't happen overnight. That took generations. But you're going to see traditions changed by the early church very, very quickly and in a very radical way. Very radical I want to rewind you back to Genesis chapter 17. Genesis chapter 17, God speaking to Father Abraham, and he says that you and every male amongst you, even those who are born into your house, are going to be circumcised. You're going to circumcise anybody that eight, any guy that's eight days or older. And this is going to be a sign. This is going to be the sign of the covenant between me and you. Did the Jews take that very seriously? The Jews took that quite seriously. In fact, back to, uh, in the intertestimonial period, remember I told you about Antiochus Epiphanes persecuting the Jews. One of the quickest ways to discover in the ancient world if somebody was a Jew was to check. <clears throat> Look at what Paul says, though, regarding this very issue. 1 Corinthians chapter 7 1 Corinthians chapter 7, verse 18. Again, written to Gentiles. You've got to remember that. Was any man called when he was already circumcised? He is not to become uncircumcised. Has anyone been called in uncircumcision? He is not to be circumcised. Circumcision is nothing, and uncircumcision is nothing, but what matters is keeping the commandments of God. Wait a minute. Genesis 17 sounds a lot like a commandment of God. Paul, what are you saying here? Paul is seeing that something radical, different, big change has happened. You have old covenant, but now you have new covenant. And under new covenant, something like circumcision is a nothing. It's done away with. And you see this as a controversy that the church decides on, and right away, the church is in agreement. Circumcision is no longer a thing when it comes to the new covenant. Not only that, flip back to Exodus chapter 31. Exodus chapter 31, you'll find God speaking this time to uh, Moses, and him giving the commandment, tell the sons of Israel to keep my Sabbath. And this is going to be a sign of, that same word, this is going to be a sign between me and you for all your generations that you will know that I am the Lord your God. Look at what Paul says. This is powerful. Colossians chapter 2, verse 16 and 17. Therefore, no one is to act as your judge in regards to food or drink or to respects of a festival or a new moon or a Sabbath day. Things which are mere shadows of what is to come, but the substance belongs to Christ. Paul once again saying that Sabbath keeping is no longer part of the deal. Under the new covenant, it's all new, and Sabbath keeping is out. That's powerful language, especially, again, do we really have an, a, an equivalent in America? I gave you the example of church attendance from the 20th century to the 21st century. And were we a Christian nation and did we identify, okay, maybe, but this is, 
This is circumcision and this is Sabbath keeping. This is their very core identity. If you were a Jew and male, you were circumcised and regardless of male, you kept the Sabbath and the kosher laws, right? But did you see Paul there saying, nobody's to judge you regarding food? And Paul spends a lot of time back in Corinthians on that too, huh? These are some powerful things regarding why. Why Easter matters and why you and I are here this morning celebrating a crucified Messiah. But the empty tomb is still another powerful symbol. You remember Matthew 28, Mark 16, Luke 24, John 20. They go to the tomb early in the morning. Who goes to the tomb early in the morning? The women go to the tomb early in the morning. Why did they go? To anoint the body. Meaning the body's still in the tomb. You don't go to anoint a body that's not in the tomb, huh? They have it in their mind, we're going to a tomb that's the tomb of Jesus, and we're going to anoint the body. Nobody has in their mind, let's go to the tomb because he's going to be out of the tomb. That's a powerful statement about the early church, but that's also a powerful statement about his early followers. I want you to see what is written in Luke. Luke chapter 24, verses 9 through 11. And returning from the tomb and reporting these things to the 11, uh, to the 11 and all the rest. Now these were Mary Magdalene and Joanna and Mary the mother of James, also the other women who were with them, telling these things to the apostles Verse 11, but these words appeared to them as nonsense and they would not believe. This is written about the apostles. The guys who get the thing moving. The guys who are the foundation of the early church. And yet the text tells us that when the apostles, the Jesus followers, the 11 guys closest to him, when they hear about this stone rolled away and angels and empty tombs, it sounds like nonsense to them and they would not believe. Let's play devil's advocate for a second, okay? Let's just say, let's just agree with the critical scholars and the gospels aren't written until the 60s, the 70s, or the 80s, 90s of the common era uh, of the first century, okay? So there's some 30 to, nine, 30 to 60 years removed from the event. Your, whoever Luke is in their view, in their view, your whoever Matthew is, your whoever John is, and you're just feeling free to invent stuff. You're just feeling free to write down whatever comes into your brain. Are you going to invent... 30, 50, 60 years after the fact that, by the way, the apostles didn't believe at first? No. You're not going to invent that story 30 or 60 years later. Why is it in the text then? Because it's happened. And because Luke felt it important to tell us the truth that when the apostles first heard about it, they said, I don't believe it. I don't believe it. And that leads me to my final point. And that would be resurrection appearances. Resurrection appearances. Uh, let's begin in Matthew 28. Matthew 28, verses 8 through 9. And they, this is the, the women, and they left the tomb quickly with fear and great joy and ran to report to the disciples. And behold, Jesus met them and greeted them. And they came up and took hold of his feet and worshipped him. We'll flip over to John, John chapter 20. Then she, she in this sentence is Mary Magdalene, when she said this, she turned around and saw Jesus standing there, but did not know it was Jesus. And Jesus said to her, woman, why are you weeping? Whom are you seeking? Supposing him to be the gardener, she said to him, sir, if you have carried him away, tell me where you have laid him and I will take him away. Jesus said to her, Mary. 
And she turned and said, and said to him in Hebrew, Rabboni, which means teacher. Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John all report that it was a woman who first saw the resurrected Jesus. By the way, in first century Judaism, if you're just going to make stuff up, you're not going to make this up. Because women did not have status, standing in Second Temple Judaism. You want proof of this? Does anybody remember that creed back from 1 Corinthians chapter 15? That Jesus died, according, died for our sins according to the scriptures, that he was buried, and that on the third day he rose again, and that he was seen by the women. The creed says that he was seen by Cephas. Second Temple Judaism, oligarchy, patriarchy, or matriarchy? Patriarchy. Incredibly patriarchy. So much so that the early church decided our official creed, we're going to omit the women and we're going to put Peter as the first witness. And yet, the Gospels all maintain that it was a woman who first saw the resurrected Jesus. Isn't that powerful testimony to the honesty of our gospel writers that despite the fact that the official creed statement was that Peter saw first, the gospels maintain that the ladies saw first. All of this is such powerful testimony to why you and I are here this morning celebrating a crucified Messiah but not just celebrating a crucified Messiah, celebrating a risen Messiah. The gospel message is so sweet and beautiful, isn't it? You and I have sinned. I've probably sinned more than you. And our sin separates us from God. Now, when I sin against you, does our relationship get better or get worse? It gets worse. Does more sin help our relationship get any better? No. We've been separated from God because of our sins. We're here this morning because Jesus died for our sins according to the scriptures. That he was buried and that he was raised again. Are you here this morning and you don't know what it is to be in Christ? Because if that's you... The gospel message is for you this morning. You can get up right now. You can come on down here. You can talk to one of our leaders after the service because we want the gospel message to go out as far and as wide and as far as it possibly can. We want as many people to hear the saving message of Jesus Christ.